Yeah. Yep. And it should be loud enough that perfect. Yeah. I'm loud anyway. Okay. So good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon. Um, besides being Medicine Grand Rounds, this is uh, part of a uh, series of uh, lectureship. So it's um, under the Congdon Visiting Scholar. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of background on the uh, Congdons and their contributions, and then I'll introduce uh, our guest speaker for today, Dr. McRae. So Natalie and Jack uh, Congdon were uh, extremely philanthropic Richmonders who made uh, very significant contributions to our community. Uh, Jack was uh, a very successful businessman with, with the trucking industry, founding Old Dominion Truck Leasing and playing an integral role in ensuring the success of Old Dominion Freight Line. In recognition of the clinical care and expertise at BCU Health, Natalie and Jack made significant investments in ensuring the future of success in the Poly Heart Center. So the Congdon Visiting Scholar was established in 2010, where Natalie and Jack uh, generously uh, uh, donated uh, um, a uh, large sum of money in the Division of Cardiology at VCU Health uh, Poly Heart Center. The purpose of the endowed fund is to host an internationally recognized cardiologist, to spend time at the Poly Heart Center and to work with our faculty and share their research. The benefit of this is recognized in the uh, techniques, research, and education shared by a talented cardiovascular physician scientist with the Poly Heart Center faculty and fellows. We are extremely fortunate today to have our 2018 Congdon Visiting Scholar, Dr. Callum McRae, who is the Vice Chair for Scientific Innovation at the Department of Medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital, um, and an Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. In 2016, uh, Dr. McRae received a $75 million grant from the American Heart Association called the One Brave Idea, which you have heard about uh, earlier, which is an initiative seeking to wipe out coronary uh, heart disease. To give you just in a few minutes a uh, quick background about Dr. McRae, um, he received his uh, Bachelor in Science with honors uh, in mammalian physiology from the University of Edinburgh in the UK, followed by his MD from the same institution. After uh, clinical training and uh, several research fellowships and clinical fellowships, he decided to pursue a PhD in human molecular genetics at the University of London. Um, after moving to the United States um, to uh, uh, Harvard Medical School, um, he went up uh, the ranks and is currently the vice chair of uh, scientific innovation at Brigham and Women's. Um, and um, he has held several administrative leadership positions, including um, associate director of the Watkins Outpatient Clinics at Brigham, chief of uh, cardiovascular medicine, and he continues to serve as clinical director of Brigham Genomic Medicine, co-director of Family Arrhythmias Clinic, and vice chair for scientific innovation. As a cardiologist, gen geneticist, and developmental biologist, Dr. McRae's work has been recognized in over 40 major grants, more than 150 published papers and over 65 reviews, chapters, and editorials. He has been invited to deliver over 160 regional, national, or international talks. Besides his exceptional track record of funding from the NIH, I'd like to mention again his, uh, his very um, uh, out of the box and new vision uh, for the future of uh, cardiovascular medicine, especially with coronary artery disease, where he received this uh, $75 million grant from the American Heart Association. He spends a lot of time also performing editorial activities, reviewing grants, uh, um, and also has uh, several inventions and patents. So in summary, Dr. McRae's contributions to research, clinical service, administration, and institutional service, as well as teaching, truly make him an outstanding physician scientist, educator, mentor, and also a really impressive strategic planner. So um, I just wanted to introduce him to you and probably propose that we hear a lot about the uh, uh, people being triple threats, but in 2007, in the music and theater industry, the term quadruple threat was also introduced. And I think 
that uh, in, in medicine and science, uh, um, Dr. McRae easily can be considered a quadruple threat based on all his talents. So please join me in welcoming Dr. McRae. So thanks to you all for coming. Thanks to Dr. Sloan for the kind introduction. Thanks to the Congdon family for their uh, contribution to making uh, my visit possible. Uh, I chose as the topic, uh, creating learning health systems for both health and disease. Um, and before I start, I want to outline these uh, conflicts of interest, although the probably the only real conflict of interest here is academic self-interest, since you're unable to measure that, uh, which actually is, as folks will have heard this morning and in almost every talk I've given in the last 20 years, is actually, I think, at the core of the problem, is that unless we're measuring it, we don't really know enough about what the problem is to be able to solve it. Most of what I'm going to tell you about I, I did in the last four years as a consequence of both uh, becoming the chair of cardiology in a large health center in Boston, and also at the same time uh, recognizing that the core problems were things that were endemic to most of medicine. Uh, and then being fortunate enough, and I should emphasize it is fortunate to get uh, the 75 million. It was a 250 word application, so in terms of return on investment, uh, it was pretty reasonable. Um, one of the things that I think we see all the time is that there are lots of things happening around us in almost every field of endeavor, of human endeavor. These existential challenges, I think, are pretty obvious in, in biomedicine for anybody who's worked at any level, from a medical student all the way through to a senior faculty member. But I've summarized them here in this text-heavy slide. Um, and they're really the fact that it's complicated. Our uh, president and many others have recognized that healthcare is just a lot more difficult than we had assumed everything else would be. Uh, precision remains elusive. We, when I was a medical student in 1985 in Edinburgh, it was called molecular medicine. We've renamed it four times since then, but the, the core theme is still the same. We'll come back to that. And we haven't really moved one iota further forward. Um, and in many instances, biomedical research is actually chronically underfunded. If you look at the average industry in the Fortune 500, uh, the investment in R&D is usually somewhere between 11 and 17%. If it were 11%, you would anticipate that the NIH's share of that would be 300 billion. And at the moment, it's about 35, 37 billion. So we're off by a factor of 10 as an entity in terms of how much we invest in research and development in biomedical science. Those of you uh, who were at this morning's talk would recognize that drug discovery remains rate limiting. It takes about seven to 10 years to develop a drug. It probably takes another 12 to 15 years to implement that drug after it reaches guidelines. But the real problem is that drug discovery is so expensive that actually it's almost no point in trying to develop precision medicine unless we develop a new way of uh, identifying drugs because we can't afford to develop any more drugs than we actually have at the moment. Uh, and so if we increase the number of diseases by being more precise, we'd have to completely change the scale factor in developing drugs. And I talked about some of that this morning and I won't talk about it again. There's actually remarkable variation in care delivery and outcomes across the world and across the country. And part of the problem is that even the things that we know we should be doing, we don't do. And I would argue, and I'm going to show you some data to support this, that the main source of variation in trying to understand precision in medicine is actually variation in therapy. That most care is delivered in a sort of artisanal way. It's not based on any data, but it's actually based on the one-to-one -one relationship between the doctor and the patient. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. And I want to emphasize that before we get into the meat of the talk, so that you don't think I'm trying to replace the patient or the provider-patient interaction. Um, what I'm really trying to do is understand why we can't do the basic things, the things that we know already should be algorithmic, why we can't do those in a reproducible and systematic fashion, the way that every other industry has managed to do. Uh, and that's largely, I think, uh, a result of uh, the fact that we don't have any def definitive systems. Uh, and then in all of this, um, everybody's not really that happy. Um, actually, I will notice that most people here are a lot happier than some of the people in Boston. Uh, but 
the core, we can argue why that might be. Uh, the core elements um, are the patient and provider. If you look at objective data, both patient and provider satisfaction are at the lowest they've been in the last 50 years. Uh, massive inefficiencies, um, electronic health records. I overheard in conversation at the start that people couldn't get into the EHR this morning because of a failure of a number of licenses in a remote Citrix client. Um, there's no other software ever implemented in any industry on the planet that made the end user experience worse. But in healthcare, we settled for that. Uh, and then I mentioned the failure of personalization, prohibitive expense of care. Even the richest economies cannot afford to deliver definitive care to everybody. And at the end of the day, there is no system. And that's really the basic problem. So what I thought I would talk about is what's missing from this concept of the learning health system. And this is, this is a concept that's been around for about probably the best part of 40 years. And it's the sense that if we just had enough information, sorry, I don't have the pointer. Oh, there we go. Maybe I'm not going to have a pointer. If you can see a mouse anywhere on yes, this, you're, I'm on the wrong screen. I'm like, there we go. No. Ah, there we go. So if you look at this, the, the concept would be, and I've sort of updated it from a slide from literally the 1960s, uh, is that with the right amount of information, we can build a, a pretty programmatic output for most of care, not all of care, but a lot of care, uh, that we can, in the instance of delivering that care, also collect additional data around not only the care, but also the intervention then generates new data which is incorporated into the system and then leads in the long run to a virtuous cycle uh, of improved knowledge. You can imagine almost everything that we do actually fits in in each of these situations, either clinical trials or really the output stage. Basic biology is something that can easily interdigitate into the input cycle. You can even imagine you can flip these around so what's input is input, what's output is What's input is output, what's output is input, depending on how you look at it. But for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to call this the output and this the input. Uh, and then with AI, with the artificial intelligence, machine learning, another area of endeavor that's been around for 40 years, but it but keeps resurfacing along the lines of precision medicine, you can begin to build better algorithms for care delivery. So why have we not been able to do this? So I think there are really two core problems. One is that almost everything in medicine is a function of the information content that we have and the data we collect. And in each instance here, and I've picked three broad instances, but almost any area of medicine, you can argue the same thing. We're, we basically don't have enough information to be able to execute on solving the problems that we know already exist. So in genetics, which is where I was, uh, spent the last 25 years, We've cloned very large effect alleles. We've cloned lots of common alleles that have small effects. But even going back to peas, you would recognize that the things that are most likely to be disease, and particularly in an organism that now for the first time, only in the last 200 years, have people consistently survived over the age of 40. So most of the selection pressure that's actually occurred is a result of environmental variables to which we've previously never been exposed. But we don't measure either uh, common traits that reflect those exposures or the exposures themselves. This is the precision medicine paradigm where you, instead of giving a drug to a mixed population, you give it to a group of individuals who will benefit from the drug. You don't give it to people with no effect or have adverse effect. This is at the core of how you change the cost of drug development. And then in care redesign, where we're beginning to think, how do we move um, really venues of care from the highly uh, intensive and highly costly inpatient setting to an outpatient setting. In heart failure, there are now, these are four of the six trials that have been done, where you take ICU measurements and you put them into somebody's home. And despite the fact that you're doing this, you're unable to change even 30-day readmission rates, which is not a particularly uh, high bar for a biology that's actually much more complicated than can ever be reflected in 30-day readmission rates. And in fact, I was mentioning uh, in discussion yesterday that one of the most interesting things is one of these retros one of the retrospective analyses of these care redesign trials, these were done in, in several uh, thousand patients, is that the best predictor of readmission was none of the physiology that we're measuring, not even PA pressures, but actually connectivity of the individual with their social network. So it was chatter and telephone calls and the ability of individuals to communicate with their friends and family. And so the core, the core problem in all of this is that phenotype, the things we measure is rate limiting, 
and the information content of the things we measure is rate limiting in every area of medicine. And the reason for that is actually largely our fault. We measure things cross-sectionally when people come to see us. We don't build any longitudinal uh, areas of exploration. Most of what we collect, I'll show you, is legacy information, stuff that was really based on anatomy and, uh, and medieval concepts of disease and hasn't really changed dramatically in the last 50 to 100 years. The success of randomized clinical trials has forced us to aggregate people into larger populations to get bigger uh, p-values, but not necessarily bigger effect sizes. Uh, and then the other thing that I think is absolutely critical is most of it does not have any longitudinal organization on any way through it. And few of any conditioning variables are ever uh, measured. Genomics highlights some of the problems, the single channel mutations that we thought were associated with very specific phenotypes in the last 10 years have now evolved that we realize that they actually cause multiple different phenotypes. Similarly, genetics on its own is not predictive. Uh, these are two families with identical mutations. One kills half the people in the family. Uh, the same mutation in another family has no effect. Why is that? What are, we, what are we failing to measure? So it could be we're failing to measure genetic modifiers. It could be we're failing to measure uh, environmental modifiers. But the reality is we could have predicted that this would be the case 100 years ago. We still haven't managed to measure one modifier, whatever it is, or even show whether it could be genetics uh, our environment. And part of that is actually this, this fundamental gap in what we actually use in our clinical toolkit. So as part of the Undiagnosed Diseases Initiative at NIH, I, I am the clinical chair of that in the Harvard system. I was asked by the NIH to actually uh, add up all the possible things you could measure in all of medicine. And if you add them all up, they come to about 9,835 things. So that includes every uh, biochemical test of 50 or 60 uh, metrics of diastolic function, uh, a whole host of things, imaging, molecular imaging, MRI, different MRI protocols. And it turns out this is pretty consistent. If you look at what we measure in animal models, it's about the same. The mouse phenotype ontology is almost identical size to the human phenotype ontology. And the reality is that if we were trying to deconvolute a genome, everybody in the room whose genome is about three times 10 to the nine nucleotides, differs by about 10 to the six nucleotides between uh, their neighbors. So if you're 10 to the six fold different than your neighbor, you couldn't ever deconvolute that, and just from basic information theory, unless you exceed the complexity of what you're trying to understand by at least two log orders. So that would mean we'd have to change the number of things that we measure by a factor of 100,000. Not by 100,000, but by a factor of 100,000. And that's only scratching the surface. We're just talking about genomics. We haven't thought about how much transcriptional variation there is, how much modification of protein there is, any of the lipids, any of the ways in which cells are connected, or even the time scales across which any of this operates. And you'll notice I put down here in the sorry left hand corner the exposome, the things that we would be exposed to. We measure only alcohol and tobacco. In addition to that, we never really think, how do we link all of these information sets together? We've never really collected information in a way in which it can be used to understand the relationships between different types of information. The electronic health record is a great example of this. Almost everything in the EHR is structured on the basis of billing or encounter design, not on the basis of the underlying biology. So the stuff that's measured in nephrology has no relevance yeah, except the, for the fact that it does, but it's not recorded as if it has relevance for cardiology or, or endocrinology or any other subspecialty. And so what we need to think if we are going to be faced to redesign everything that we collect is how would you do this in a way that links not only every field in clinical medicine, but also every field in clinical medicine with every field in basic biomedical research. And so if you think about it, there are really only a couple of things that integrate across scales all the way from a single molecule to a whole population. And those are really small molecules or, or physical challenges. And we'll come back to that, but obviously small molecules are everything in our environment, including our nutrition, which we already know is a critical part of most diseases. Uh, biophysical stimuli are, are extrinsic physical stresses, uh, but they're also uh, the actual uh, longitudinal effects of chronic uh, aging, fibrosis, and a whole host of other things. So what we need to begin to do, I believe, and I'm going to show you some of the strategies that I think we need to 
to do to enable this, and also some of the ways that we've actually done it, uh, because we have actually, uh, in the last three or four years, managed to do some very simple initial experiments in this space, to collect data in a way where we understand the biology, not on the basis of some pre predetermined hypothesis, but just examining everything as if it's a logical operator in a true uh, computational system. This is just another way of looking at the same problem. It's how do we move beyond legacy? I mentioned this uh, yesterday when I was talking in a, an AHA uh, format. I, this is the electronic health record, most of which with all of our digitization still represents essentially a semi-subjective recollection of purely subjective data. Uh, there are a few uh, notable biomarkers that are collected in a consistent enough way to actually understand them, but very few. Um, glycosuria is the uh, classic example of how far off the mark you can get. So sugar in the urine is really a terminal stage uh, phenotype in uh, cardiometabolic disease. But the entire infrastructure for diabetic management is based on essentially what is a medieval phenotype, dipping your fingers in urine and tasting it and finding that it's sweet. Uh, and most interestingly, work done by actually a, a, a Richmond native, Dr. Rob Gersten, uh, whose father, I believe, is a pathologist uh, here, um, showed almost a decade ago that branched-chain amino acid abnormalities antedate any abnormality of glucose handling, even stimulated glucose handling, by about a decade. Uh, but we still haven't managed to implement that in the clinic, largely because all of the therapy is, fo is focused on glycemic control, which all of the studies show doesn't actually lead to any benefit. And it's only now that SGLT2 inhibitors are becoming available, where suddenly the benefits from treating diabetes are not actually related to glycemic control, but people are reimagining how you might measure the end phenotypes of the underlying biology that causes diabetes. And we've done this uh, in a number of settings. Uh, I mentioned this morning a trial that we had done in laminopathy, which is a very specific form of insulin resistance. And we were able to, deter to define phenotypes not only in terms of uh, metabolism, but also in terms of capillary morphology using single fiber confocal, uh, thermography just to map brown adipose tissue distribution. Even the EKG has some features that are consistent with particular forms of insulin resistance. And then you can, if you have to go to MRI, you can actually document lipodystrophy and abnormal distribution of lipid uh, stores. Um, almost everything could be used to characterize the way in which a diabetic biology is different. Even the microbiome has been recently shown to antedate any abnormalities of glucose handling. So your, your entire body changes for a decade before you ever actually show any abnormalities of blood sugar or urinary sugar. So this is a sort of paradigm that I think if we were able to overcome this type of thing in a very small and narrow setting, can we believe, can we think about it and believe that we could imagine defining disease more multidimensionally in a way that would allow us to understand all diseases in this way? And so this was what we were funded. I'm going to go through this very quickly, just for those of you who weren't there yesterday. This is what we were funded by Google and by AstraZeneca and by the American Heart Association to do, which was to take coronary disease, which at the moment is this sort of late stage set of syndromes based on uh, plaque uh, growth, plaque rupture, uh, obstruction of the artery, and acute coronary syndromes of remodeling to form uh, chronic disease. Uh, and instead of focusing on this, really mo move back and start to define what it is to be healthy in a quantitative, multidimensional fashion, both a baseline and in the context of perturbations. And to do that in a way where we would take this generic pre disease, move to very specific forms of cardiometabolic disorder, understand how those differentially led to different types of disease. That does two things. One, it lets you identify the genetics much more rigorously because you're not lumping everybody who looks like they're the same together. The other thing it does is it lets you build technologies that can follow these things over long periods of time, understand trajectories. And then finally, what it lets you do is begin to think about how you stratify for disease diagnosis, for disease um, causation, and then ultimately for disease therapy. And so we promised the AHA that we would uh, identify some new markers of uh, the very earliest stages of coronary disease, define at least one new underlying causal mechanism, uh, and develop technologies for population detection of coronary disease at a very early stage, and use that to try and move towards new therapeutic and digital uh, maintenance strategies. The core idea is that most of what we measure is late stage 
By the time you're diabetic, uh, everybody has coronary disease. By the time you have coronary disease, most people have abnormalities of stimulated insulin resistance. It's a sort of self-fulfilling uh, prophecy almost. So we could begin to use the sort of unbiased technologies that might be available, and we could discuss towards uh, the end what some of those might be. But we're really trying to build a framework where we understand what information could be used to understand diseases more rigorously, and how could you do it in a way that would be powerful. We'd already done some of this in heart failure. We built about uh, four and a half, five years ago, a little next generation phenotyping suite in the clinic where we used uh, simple um, portable tools to measure auditory evoked responses, gait, galvanic skin resistance, all of those things. You can see you're actually able to identify several things very easily. In fact, we've we just uh, uh, published a, a series of electrical uh, analyses that actually parse left ventricular hypertrophy into benign LVH, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, AL amyloid, uh, and TTR amyloid. Uh, and just some of this is shown here. You can actually differentiate uh, AL amyloid very nicely from TTR amyloid because AL amyloid doesn't penetrate the brain, uh, whereas TTR amyloid is native, it's in the cell. Uh, stride length, this was a, a near-infrared camera sitting above the Equilab. Uh, you're able to identify fiduciary points in your skeleton. You can actually map gait. You can discriminate uh, ischemic from non-ischemic forms of heart failure, essentially with 100% uh, with um, accuracy. The AUC is literally 1.0. Uh, and then we did also some uh, stuff to look at uh, skin biology and try and understand some of the cell biology of the heart. And we were able to show that some of the cell biology, this is not necessarily generalizable. Don't imagine that I'm thinking that it is. Uh, but that you could actually take some of the cell biology uh, from the heart and detect it in buccal smears. And importantly, you could actually also look at drug responses in buccal smears. So this is published, uh, placoglobin mislocalization to the nucleus occurs in the cheek swabs of people who are genotype positive for ARVC gene defects. You can add drugs that rescue that syndrome and it reverses on a cover slip uh, on a patient sample and you can show that you can rescue that phenotype. So in coronary disease, we're trying to digitize ways of looking at retinal patterning, looking at macrophage um, uh, membrane um, biology and also uh, lipid handling, looking at real-time indices of vascular tonometry in response to extrinsic uh, stimuli, which has already been shown by many investigators using invasive techniques to, in teenage kids, predict uh, risk of vascular disease, and then looking at drug responses and nutritional responses to try and characterize more precisely. One other thing that's worth pointing out is that all of the genes that have been implicated in lipids and coronary disease, the causal genes, the familial hypercholesterolemia genes, every one of them turns out to be A, ubiquitously expressed, B, is involved in a, a network of genes that actually controls epithelial and endothelial morphogenesis. And this is work that actually led to the Nobel Prize uh, for Drosophila genetics in the mid-90s. Every gene in the network is linked together in something that determines the shape of the wing and fly. Uh, that's just one way that it was measured. And if you look at this network, which as I said, was published in the mid nineties, it links hypertension, coronary disease, diabetes, dementia, uh, cardiometabolic syndrome. All of the core genes are in this single network that was identified literally uh, almost 30 years ago in uh, in Drosophila wing. So by measuring things that may not necessarily be directly orthogonal, uh, directly in line, but may be completely orthogonal to what you're interested in, you actually get information about the biology. And this information allows you to build barcodes of essentially diagnostic and therapeutic utility that complement but do not replace the clinical encounter. So um, in addition to this, you can also imagine, uh, particularly if you're working with Google, uh, you almost uh, have to do this, um, ways of identifying much more rigorously what it is that we eat, ways of identifying much more rigorously what it is we've been exposed to, not necessarily in measuring every single entity, but just knowing where you are actually gives you geographic um, indices of what you've been exposed to. So for example, if you had ever been to Scotland, you would have been exposed to this, the Scottish breakfast, which has a LD50 of about 100. Um, and then uh, the other things that you can map very easily uh, are relating this between individuals, both genetic and social, and that actually correlates with many disease uh, entities, not least obesity and uh, psychiatric disease. And so we've begun to try and do this in a systematic way. I'm not going to go into it in any detail, 
partly because of the fact that you can imagine we're early in the stages of doing this. We need to actually show success in order to be able uh, to be convincing. Uh, but some of the things that we've done just in the first six months of working on this are show, uh, for example, a I keep losing the, uh, the mouse here, but not to worry, uh, show that uh, actually every one of the genes that causes lipid abnormalities actually causes a developmental abnormality of the way in which the blood vessels are formed. So that your blood vessels are primed for disease before you ever before your cholesterol is ever elevated. Uh, similarly, we've we've actually started working with the elementary school to try and define what wellness really is. If you talk to children, they actually define wellness as a, in a very complex way as actually the ability to play with their friends and compete in multiple different ways in a in a, in a setting that allows them to maintain their social status. And I would never have predefined that as a metric of wellness. But we're now actually using wearables to try and build a multidimensional assessment of that so that we can actually look at that as a childhood metric of wellness. Not the only one, but a very powerful one when you think about it. Uh, we've started to expand physiology. We, me we measure, what, 13 different uh, analytes in routine clinical care. There are as many enzymes that have molybdenum as a cofactor as there are enzymes that have magnesium as a cofactor. When was the last time you ever man, measured molybdenum? I don't think you probably have. Uh, so we've begun to just look much more broadly at every uh, ion in the entire periodic table. This is now possible because of essentially 96 well-played X-ray spectroscopy. You can actually measure fluxes of individual ions across a red cell membrane in real time in a clinical sample with and without ATP. Um, we've actually just, um, uh, as I mentioned, using imaging to identify dietary uh, input, you can actually match that to large databases of the dietary content, whether collected from the label or from molecular analysis of food. And so you can begin to expand. This is a map of nutrition based on uh, the 150 uh, elements in the uh, uh, existing uh, FDA guidelines. This is what the map looks like if you flesh it out uh, with all of the molecular constituents. So you can see you have a much, much broader dynamic range. Almost all of the action in the traditional analysis is basically in discriminating between carbohydrate, protein, uh, and lipid. Here, there are many, many, many more constituents, all at very different concentrations. Uh, we've begun, as you probably saw, Jay Schenger from WashU characterized the entire BRCA1 gene. So now you can actually assess function on an individual residue. We've done that for all of the uh, hypercholesterolemia genes. Uh, and then ultimately, what we really think we need to do is to change the culture about how we investigate these things by bringing essentially discovery and clinical care in both health and disease together. And so uh, ultimately, what we'd like to do is to build a sort of generalizable approach to computable phenotypes, to things that you can collect without having to think about them. ambient data that come in from the outside. Uh, I mentioned to some people at dinner last night that I worked 10 years ago with a, a construction company that was building real estate in Florida in a way that the home could monitor the patients who were likely to be in the homes. And if, if commercial real estate is thinking about this 10 years ago, why is it that medicine has really resisted the types of change that we would need in order to collect data in a much more dynamic and continuous fashion in, real, in the real world so that we begin to learn in real time? And so ultimately what we'd like to do is to take existing uh, data sets, add perturbations that yield information. Those could be nutritional or, or uh, small molecule, could be drug-related responses. When was the last time you documented the physiologic response to a drug outside of the ICU? Almost never. And so why do we waste people's time by giving them drugs that may, may or may not have an effect without measuring the effect of those drugs? We simply ask them how they're doing uh, in most instances rather than measuring objectively exactly what the contributors are. And ideally, what we'd like to do is to begin to move uh, all the way down this causal pathway so that everybody could be participating in clinical trials all the time, which is what happens in all of the rest of our lives. So Google, for example, tests probably five different hypotheses every time you load a web page. They're analyzing where, what's the position of the ad, what's the size of the font, what's the color of the, the um, particular uh, font that you're using. All of these things are, are things they can very quickly identify what works and what doesn't work. So in the last uh, 15 minutes, I'm going to go through what I think is actually a more important piece than any of this. And the reason is that until you actually unify and make uniform delivery of care, most of what you're measuring, no matter how you measure it, 
is going to be essentially variation in the input. And what we really want to understand is the biology, not the, the therapy or the way in which the doctors or the nurses or anybody else uh, uses therapy. And the core problem in this is that most of healthcare is basically uh, on a very unusual business model. We sit in our offices and we wait for people to come to us. This is traditional care. People arrive uh, on this graph. This is health in green. You start to get into trouble when you're in uh, yellow and then you end up with an objective evidence of disease. And shortly after that, often people show up in some way because we define those diseases based on symptoms. Those symptoms have really been present in the human population for, for centuries in many instances. And then we basically manage, we apply drugs that have been designed largely around this part of the therapeutic trajectory. But even in that space, we do remarkably badly. If you look at, uh, this is data from 2016, looking at diabetic care. So the goals of diabetic care would be a hemoglobin A1C less than seven, a blood pressure less than 130 over 70, these probably have been modified recently given the SPRINT guidelines, and an LDL less than 100. What percentage of diabetics in, in the developed world meet all of those goals? Well, it's less than 20%. So whatever we're doing, we're not able even to execute on the elements. And there are lots of reasons for that. Not all of them are our fault. But part of the problem is we don't even understand why we're not executing on any of this, because we're, we don't have a system for documenting what happened at any point in time. Uh, in cardiology, I believe, uh, and in some other areas like cancer screening, we have moved into this preventative area. But what our uh, consumers would like, what our patients are ideally before they become patients would like, is actually for us to identify what it is to be well and to maintain that. And until we actually begin to build systems that allow us to do that, I think we're going to be in real trouble. Uh, the majority of the trajectories that we have in medicine are incredibly sparse. This is just a a reflection of them. You notice these are the lifetime risk curves. This is work from Don Lai Jones for the key risk factors for cardiometabolic disease. And you'll notice every one of them starts at 50 because we haven't measured enough data before the age of 50 for any of these risk factors. The other thing that's worth pointing out and shows you just how different the risks are depending on what the risk factors truly are. As you can see here, total cholesterol is a nice uh, sigmoidal curve, whereas diabetes almost goes straight up. And this is just a reflection of what I told you before, which is a day of diagnosis, everybody has, with diabetes, everybody has coronary disease. It's just we haven't built, built technologies that allow us to detect it. When I became chief of cardiology at the Brigham, I did an analysis of what was happening in our clinics, and I found that about 40% of all face-to-face -face visits had no discernible change in the output. So the only thing that happened was the charge was dropped. There was no new testing. There was no uh, new therapy. 40% of visits. This is, it turns out, is pretty similar in most specialty clinics uh, in most of North America and in most of uh, Western Europe. Uh, what do providers add to this face-to-face -face interaction? Well, they add cost, they add variation, uh, they add arcane workflow practices. Health obviously can go awry at any time of day, but most of outpatient care is nine to five. In fact, one of the things that we found when we started to reinvent of, in a very small way, outpatient care was the best thing about it is patients could actually get care at, at night and at weekends, which is when they want to get their care, rather than spending a half day off work to get their LDL um, tested once and their dose of statin changed by 10 milligrams or whatever usually happens. We had remarkable scaling constraints. It's very difficult to scale a system that requires face-to-face -face interaction in a synchronous fashion. Uh, what we think we're really good at is pattern recognition, biologic insight, pharmacologic insight, and the human connection. And I'm gonna show you that each of these turn out to be much, much more readily done by a system that involves a college kid and a computer. No need whatsoever for any training to do any of these. In fact, as you would predict, pattern recognition computers are way better at pattern recognition than we are uh, because they're not being distracted by people paging them or pulling them in other directions or trying to do everything in an 11 minute face-to-face uh, -face encounter. What I do believe is actually one thing that providers consistently supply, and which I think will be our survival mechanism, is actual investigative functions. This is what it means to be a professional, if you think about it. The medieval definition of a professional is the ability to help in clients interpret ambiguous data. If it's not ambiguous, you don't need a professional, but we've held on to a whole host of things that are actually pseudo-professional uh, and just make it really seem like what we're trying to do is protect our turf rather than actually drive the care of our patients further forward. 
When you try to move all of this to a digital environment, the first thing you recognize is patients, real patients, actually people who have disease, uh, don't want to do this any more than the doctors do. So the main reason uh, for cardiologists, for example, we looked at um, all heart failure patients in the partner system, uh, that's Mass General and the Brigham, uh, that did not attend a, an advanced heart failure clinic. And we found that only 5% of them were on the maximal doses of all five agents that were indicated by the guidelines. And the most interesting thing is that the main reason for this when we analyzed it, each, each of these black segments, is that's the part that's due to the fact that the doctor never tried it. So the provider never actually tried any of these drugs. They may have thought about it, they didn't document it. Whatever happened, this was the main source of variation. On the patient side, the thing that you'll notice is people are very comfortable talking on the phone. But even in uh, San Francisco and Boston, the two areas that were in this raw health survey, only about 24% of people who have actually have disease are willing to think about using an online tool to help them manage their own disease. So what we had to do was build a system that would begin to learn, uh, would actually allow us to overcome the resistance of both doctors and other providers, as well as patients to the fully digital systems, and would take some of this out of the traditional care path and do it in a way that left the patient still with a human connection. So the first thing we did was to create a series of computable care management algorithms. And every guideline, you can imagine how you would do this. You build an AI algorithm to work out who in the population meets the actual intervention. You create a, a, a series of software um, algorithms that deliver that in a very systematic way to either the provider or to the patient. Ultimately, it will be the patient. But in the meantime, what we decided we would do is task shift everything in most complex medical decision making down to a college graduate. So everything that I'm going to show you has been executed by essentially people who are fresh out of college. One or two of them have MPHs, all supervised by one pharmacist per 10,000 patients. No doctors involved in almost any instance unless a trigger was activated. And in most of these algorithms, the trigger activation rate is less than 1%. In some algorithms, like lipid management, it's four or five per thousand patients. Uh, not thousand patient encounters, thousand patients. Uh, and then what you do is you basically give patient support using, as I mentioned, uh, college navigators, pharmacists, and with very clearly identified safety pop-offs to nursing or MDs. Uh, you allocate drugs based on what the actual data show. You eliminate prior authorization completely. We were able to actually get two of the payers to take drugs uh, that were not on the formulary and put them in the formulary because of the fact that uh, we were able to show that we would use them only in certain instances. Uh, and then what you basically begin to do then is implement this in real time. Uh, what this does is it allows you to scale very rapidly. We were able to scale many of these to tens of thousands of patients. Uh, we were able to implement rapid cycle improvements. So if you have a new drug, you can introduce it across the population, not in 12 to 14 years, but actually in one to two weeks, if you change two or three lines of code, and then you run everybody through the system. Uh, the other thing that you can do is you can begin to enhance education. You've identified the patients better. You can drive education down the same channels that you use to actually collect data from them or to give them information about their uh, therapy. Uh, we've begun to develop pragmatic clinical trials. We, we're building in, in a couple of areas regulatory level feedback. So you need to be able to look at compliance. You need to be able to look at side effects. And all of these have patient reported outcome measures that are based on daily uh, prompted uh, use of a phone application. Uh, what we find is you actually get a dramatic integration of traditional and non-traditional techniques. So coaching is, is an important part of this. The human connection actually is much better if it comes when you want it, rather than three months later when you can actually have an appointment with your physician. You can get the human connection here with a very uh, pleasant person who's been trained in commuter and consumer uh, services, and you can get it 24 seven instead of having to wait until the next day. This is one of the main reasons that people stop taking drugs. We took, uh, for example, in this, once we had done the initial pilot, we took uh, 500 people who were uh, labeled as statin intolerant, and we got every one of them at goal on the statin uh, within 12 weeks. Uh, in fact, almost everything that you see in this cycle can happen in a very short space of time. Uh, we build out these algorithms so that every single interaction is a logical operator. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to do anything. You know that when you reach this step, it triggers this change in therapy and that lab be being collected at this time. And that then feeds back into the system. 
This is the type of screen that a navigator was, will see. You, you can then imagine moving that, transitioning it as it learns. And as patients become more clinically adept at using structured subroutines, you can then move it to uh, actual patients. What does this actually look like? Uh, it's basically optimizing provider roles. We're able to take virtual uh, assistance and scale dramatically the number of individuals they can look after. So an average navigator can look after somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 patients at any given time in an active titration regimen. Uh, what does this look like um, in terms of results? So we took, uh, these are data, almost all of these are based on populations of at least 1,500 patients. Uh, as I said, we've now scaled most of them to much larger. Uh, so LDL reductions were about 40 millimeters, 40% uh, reductions rather, uh, with about a 60% cost reduction. These uh, platforms have now billing codes from two uh, pairs in Massachusetts. Blood pressure, 20 millimeter reduction in systolic blood pressure, a 12 millimeter reduction in diastolic. This is the equivalent of almost every trial ever performed in blood pressure. Uh, you don't want to get me started on what blood pressure is as an endpoint. Um, retention of human connection, as we, we found in our heart failure program, that it's better not to measure blood pressure because it usually limits the amount of drug that you get on because the rate limiting step is symptomatic hypertension. So just get rid of the blood pressure measurement and wait until the symptomatic and then measure, measure the blood pressure. That actually also accelerates the, uh, the cycle time of this. Uh, one other thing that I think is actually quite important is Bluetooth pairing a blood pressure cuff. I think is a marker of mild cognitive impairment. I think every single person in our blood pressure trial found it almost impossible to do that on their own without an intervention from outside. So we had to move all of our blood pressure cuffs from Bluetooth, uh, either to Bluetooth LE, which is a community-wide uh, local service, or to wireless or uh, Wi-Fi. Uh, we did that in collaboration with cable companies and with phone companies. And then the other thing that I think is absolutely vital is these are the three segments of human connection. So the, basically the patients thought that they actually improved the human connection of their interactions with the care delivery system 77% of the time. And this is the result, I think, of a survey of over 900 patients. Interestingly, when we looked at the doctors, uh, what the physicians were most worried about was losing control. Uh, within about six weeks, they are actually asking us for uh, documented order sets so that they could refer all of their patients to this algorithm for lipids and blood pressure. Heart failure, I think, we're undergoing the same sorts of transitions. Diabetes has already been devolved in many instances to care delivery platforms that are outside the existing uh, healthcare system. You get uniform implementation, you get very agile workflow redesign, and it's around the biology of the disease, not around the architecture of the revenue stream. Uh, the data return uh, cycles determine what you can do. If you have really good data return, you can begin to imagine, as I mentioned, doing a real-world clinical trial. And our first real-world trial is going to start in the spring of next year using injectable sRNA to manage lipids as if it was a vaccination strategy. Uh, and then finally, uh, at the end of the day, all of the transactions in this system stratify the patients. You don't need any new biomarkers. You know exactly what a patient is like based on where they are in the algorithm. So if you reach 0.56 in this algorithm, I know exactly what the previous 55 points were, what happened at each of them, what the deltas were, and how those feed back into the system. We're also collecting a whole host of other data uh, in an effort to try and really systematize this. The last couple of slides, these are the algorithms we're doing at the moment. We've already finished our outpatient heart failure algorithm. We're about to start our inpatient heart failure algorithm. We're doing anticoagulation diabetes, cross-cutting metrics and hyperkalemia with new drugs for that anemia and immunosuppression. Turns out this is actually an artifact of one of the trials that Paul Ritker did in immunosuppression and coronary disease. His algorithm performed so much better than a rheumatologist that the rheumatologist asked us to put immunosuppression as a metric in one of our uh, systems. Uh, the, the background analytics are really important. We are actually collecting uh, a lot of these data and then analyzing them in a fully automatic fashion. We just had the uh, luxury of having Rahul Deo join us and he's built a completely hands-off echo analysis system that actually ends up, as you can tell from these data, uh, not only being able, these are the 5% and uh, plus and minus 5% data, so you can see very good correlation with uh, existing uh, data sets on any of the left ventricular uh, measurements that you would be interested in, including ejection fraction. You can actually build automated trajectories for many of these. You can build automated strategies to uh, actually identify hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And it turns out the feature that was most important in this was not actually LVH, it was actually atrial volume. 
Uh, and then the other thing that's quite interesting is, again, the ability to distinguish uh, different forms of amyloid from other forms of LVH based on subtle features of the way in which the contractile patterns are disturbed. Other things that you can measure are the transactions themselves. Uh, existing technologies, we're using nuance technology, uh, which you may have used for dictation. We're using it actually not only to identify people uniquely, but also to assess their physiologic state. There's some very nice heart failure detection algorithms that are based on voice uh, uh, phenotypes. And then obviously introducing all of the emerging technologies that I talked about at the start uh, of my lecture. The goal is ultimately to begin to build a much more granular, uh, dynamic response trajectory all the way from wellness through life. But to do that, in order to actually be able to implement that, to overcome the resistance in the current system, you have to be able to deliver something that affects care today. So as I mentioned, each of these has already been implemented uh, in a uh, real care setting outside of our hospital uh, in conjunction with a pair. And we have uh, actual chronic care management billing codes that are ded dedicated to these programs uh, already from two pairs in Massachusetts. Ultimately, the ideal would be to use this to build novel trial strategies that ultimately would involve actual A-B testing in the context of the network. There are many things in medicine that we don't really understand because there's no external funder to, to support a clinical trial. For example, uh, heparin is one of the best examples. Uh, there's no randomized controlled trial of unfractionated heparin in any setting you know, that has ever shown any change in outcome with the exception of it shortens length of stay in acute coronary syndromes if you give streptokinase by about uh, one day. That's the only data for heparin. Why is that not being tested? Well, because we don't have the infrastructure to test the things that we think about in real time. With this type of system, you could imagine testing these questions just in our local system, which has now several tens of thousands of patients in it, very, very, very quickly. So the goal would be to essentially create at least some of the foundation. This is a very rudimentary first step uh, of a real world learning platform. And ultimately the goal is to integrate care delivery, um, real world trials, phenotyping, phenotyping innovation, and fundamental research, as well as real translational analytics in a single system, which I believe is actually the main problem is in medicine is the research and development are in a separate industry from the actual care delivery. And if we can improve that, I think we'll have done a great deal. And by doing this, I think we're, we're actually directly integrating care, innovation, and discovery. I'm not gonna have time to talk about this, but if anybody's interested, this brings a whole new set of industries to bear around healthcare. In fact, uh, you probably heard Jeff Immelt when he retired said every industry is a healthcare industry. And if you don't think that, you've missed completely uh, what's happening in healthcare. And I can tell you about uh, everything from Walmart through to uh, Apple and how they're thinking about healthcare. Uh, we showed Walmart uh, our, our instance of the electronic health record and the CEO said, oh, that's great. That looks roughly where our supply chain management was in 1986, which didn't make our leadership very happy because we just spent one and a half billion dollars on it. So in summary, information content is rate limiting in all of medicine. The need for new information content, I think, offers unique opportunities for us to redesign the system for clinical care, for research, and for decision making together. Uh, even rudimentary systems, this is something that you could have done. This is Coumadin Clinic for the rest of medicine. And you could have done this 30 years ago. The fact that we haven't is, I think, just a testament to the vested interests that resist it. Uh, and it's only because of the fact that now there's this intense pressure to do it that we're actually able to execute on this. Uh, truly integrated systems, I think, are feasible with the right data and the right transactions. And as we're thinking about reinventing this, the only constant is biology, and that's why all the providers in the room, all the researchers in the room, will contribute to this in very meaningful ways going forward. This is something a tech company can't do on its own. This is something a retail company can't do on its own. What it needs is really dedicated professionals actually truly understand human biology, working directly with all, all of these new partners. Uh, acknowledge a huge number of folks at uh, partners, but perhaps the most important thing to do is highlight my uh, innovation teams is Ben Sirico, who's also a very well-known clinical trialist. Uh, Tom Gaziano is an economist uh, and also a clinical trialist. Uh, our heart failure was led by Akshay Desai, our lipids by Jorge Putsky, our blood pressure by Nomi Fisher. Scott Solomon and Brian Bardmark are now working on some of our background AI and some of the imaging. And thank you, uh, and thank my funders, and thank you for your attention. Sorry, I spoke longer than I intended. Thank you, that was a 
been talked about. And uh, what what question comes to my mind from your from this talk is that, that, that there is a significant or, or major disruption that we should be expecting in our sector and the delivery economy. Uh, and, and how do you see our current setup and, and from the clinical side, education side, research side, fitting into uh, these changes that, that you're talking about? So that's, a, that's a very good question. I think uh, the way I look at it is if we manage the transition, it's going to be much better than if it's managed from the outside. Uh, so the transition, for example, I, I, I give the example uh, yesterday at lunchtime, the best example comparator is probably uh, travel agents. So travel agents spend a lot of time, we're really excited to get out their equivalent of the electronic health record, which was the Sabre system. A year later, they were all out of a job. Now, luckily, uh, we are going to take much longer for that to happen. And I don't think we'll all be out of a job. But what is going to happen is some aspects of care are going to completely disappear. Uh, so there are some elements that you truly have to imagine are going to move uh, completely outside of medicine. In fact, in many countries, they have. So in many countries, statins, lipid management, blood pressure management, it's over the counter. People have actually been um, entrusted with that themselves. And one of the things I think is intrinsic here is it's changing the trust dynamic between the professions and the patients. If we take charge of that and do it, I think we'll be less likely to be disrupted externally. But believe you me, every company on the planet is thinking about disrupting us, and they don't think they need doctors at all. Ed. Follow up with that, since our chair is in the front row, we talked a little bit about this. What's going to happen to revenues? What was the outcome of, of your system on billing? So the outcome of our system billing was actually uh, to increase revenue in the cardiology division by 20%. And the way that happened is it basically freed us up to see more new patients. We took our new patient lag time from 56 days to zero. Uh, we improved, as I mentioned, our average number of new patients per session by about 1.5. Um, we increased the panel size for primary care in the Brigham practices. Uh, we projected it somewhere between 140 and 150 patients per PCP uh, once the system reaches equilibrium. And so we think you can begin to factor all of this in uh, in a very different way if we're controlling it. Now, what happens if it happens outside is it's siphoning people out of the system. So the real challenge is to make sure that we're building a system that allows us to think about how we use the face-to-face, -face, the bricks and mortar resources more effectively. Uh, and ultimately, I think as you and I talked about earlier today, that's going to involve most people that will be in a hospital will be in an ICU. Most people who don't need to be in a hospital will be managed by something like this. And so uh, I think this transition will take place more, in a more graded fashion than has happened in other industries, although I think that will largely be defined by the fact that we have, uh, at the moment, a statutory power to hold on to this. If that didn't exist, we'd be gone in a heartbeat, literally. I mean, you have, if, you, if you could see how uh, intense is the investment in this area in some of these large companies you would you'd be really worried about large segments of non-procedural care and even procedural uh, they are there is uh, a very strong uh, vested interest outside healthcare in looking at this as the last accessible part of the economy and even back of the envelope estimates suggest we're off by what one and a half two trillion dollars in terms of how much else we spend Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Make sure I've